Welcome to another edition of Lying on the Beach. I'm Steve Greenberg with Lois Whitman. And today we've got an extra special guest who I think you all know and love. It's Lucy Arnez Luckinville. Uh, she is an actor, singer, dancer, producer. She's been married to the talented actor, playwright, director, and great Star Trek villain, Larry Luckinville, for 40 years. They have five amazing children and most recently two amazing grandchildren. Uh, Lucy started her career in show business as the daughter of the legendary Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. But as we all know, famous parents can only take you so far and Lucy has gone way further. Lucy has a, had a steady career on TV, film, theater, uh, an amazing list of uh, her resume is amazing. I've actually seen her in Two for the Seesaw and Whose Life Is It Anyway? So that's and the, I've seen her in Playing Our Song, which I think is the best Broadway show ever. She is nothing less than amazing. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lucy Arnez Luckinville. Hey, Lucy. Well. That's the best introduction I got from anybody ever, <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> but I think the longer you live, of course, your introduction <laughs> should get better. Um, absolutely. <laughs> right? So I'm going to ask the first question off the bat is that, you know, you've managed to keep so especially busy as you're getting, you know, you're, you're not a spring chicken. None of us are here. And no, yet, you know, no we care. Hollywood is all about young, 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 millennials, kids. How do you keep maintaining at, you know, as the years go on? What, what, what's the secret to getting through the Hollywood formula? <laughs> I don't live in Hollywood and I don't work in Hollywood. That's how. I could, that's I'm smart. so not Hollywood. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I was born and raised there. That's my connection to Hollywood. And I've done some shows and some episodes of, you know, a couple of different television series over the years. I lived there as an adult with my children for four years. But I... I'm not one of those people. I'm a theater person primarily. You know, when I moved to New York 39 years ago, or, you know, I, li I moved to New York when I was 24, and I lived there for 39 years. And then we moved out and lived, and now we're in Palm Springs. But it, I, I don't really appreciate Hollywood all that much, although I'm sitting in the middle of it right now as I'm speaking to you because <laughs> you're doing business. But um, I don't try to play that game. I can't. I do theater, I do concerts, I produce, and I direct when I get an opportunity or it's a gift to be able to do that. I teach, I do some master classes, you know, and I raise my children, which is 90% of my life, even though they're grown, <laughs> so they say. Um, <laughs> and now I have a couple of grandchildren, so I have a wonderful husband. I don't look at the business as the be all end all you know i run an estate of my mother and my dad and i have to deal with all that business every single day in my life so it's i diversified a long time ago and it's a good thing but lucy how do you how you know a lot of people can't keep a career in hollywood or broadway going how is it that you have managed to do so well i mean do you think it's your ambition do you think it's hereditary do you think that you network or do you get up every day and you send, you know, 500 people, hello, I'm here, email? How does Boy, that work? You know, first of all, I love that you say that somehow I'm connected because I don't feel so connected. I mean, I really don't. What you said is true. It's a very youth-oriented society, Hollywood and show business in general, unless you've been established big time for a very, very long time. You know, unless you started when you were 20 and you never have stopped making great films and you're a Meryl Streep or you're a Kate Blanchett or you're a Tom Hanks or something like that. I never was one of those people. I made a couple of films. They were okay. That's, I didn't go that direction. I made a couple of television series. They were okay and mostly canceled. They were never huge successes except when I was on Mom's show. That was fine. But I was 15, you know. So I don't mm. think, I, I know I never had a success really in that field. I think I'm respected by the people in the in the industry, maybe because of the pedigree, maybe because the work I have done has been good, but I'm not a star in that sense, in that Hollywood sense. I went out and I I played the boards, as they say. You know, I do eight shows a week. I work uh, with the gypsies. I do that kind of stuff. And it's always been thrilling to me. And a long, 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 long time ago, when I was about 23 years old, a wonderful director, who was responsible for Seesaw, which you saw, Steve, and yes. uh, also A Chorus Line and Dream Girls, uh, Michael Bennett, 
met with me after he directed me in Seesaw and said, you know, if you move to New York and you make the world know that you are intending on being a great theater person, being in front of a live audience on stage doing shows, uh, you will gain a, a type of respect that you will never lose. And it's not true in television. And it's not true in films necessarily, unless you have a very long career. And I believed him because <laughs> I, I believed everything he said in those days. He was just so brilliant and he was my mentor. And so I moved to New York and I started becoming part of that community and I started getting jobs in theater. And it's true what he said. In New York, if you've done some plays over the years, you have a tenure that never goes away. You walk into Sardi's and your picture is there in the major d, no matter who he is, whether it's George or Frank or the new guy, right? And they say, oh, Miss Arnez, we have a table for you right here. In Hollywood, if your series is canceled or your movie didn't do well, you're a persona non grata no matter where you go. They take your name off the parking spot and you don't work again. I mean, it's a very moment-to-moment -moment kind of place, Los Angeles, Hollywood, and the movie business. But theater welcomed me in a way that nobody else ever did. So I never left. I always felt that I was part of that community. And even when I moved out to L.A. for a couple of years to raise kids and be with my mom before she died, um, I never felt that I was a part of Los Angeles. I just felt like I was visiting. And now, strangely enough, in my dotage, I have moved back to California, but, on, but not to Hollywood. I live in the desert. I live in the hot Palm Springs desert uh, with an amazing community of people that make me feel like New York. They, you know, it's a very small, close-knit community. Then we protect one another and we, we uh, appreciate one another's talents. And we are not all retired people. We just live there because we like the mountains and we like the way it feels. And I know you do the too. People, yeah, who are some of the people in showbiz that are around you? David Zippel. Uh, who was a magnificent Broadway lyricist, lives there full time. He, he travels all the time, but he, his main house is in Palm Springs. Uh, Robert Greenblatt, who ran NBC for years and now mm. runs HBO Time Warner, lives there most of the time. Uh, uh, Joe Montello, the director, has a house and lives there a lot of the time. Wow. Chris Marlowe, wonderful musical uh, director and arranger. I mean, there's a huge group of uh, people who have been in the industry and, you know, until recently, the great ladies, you know, the Carol Channing and Kay Ballard, you know, the wonderful grand dames of television and theater were there. Keely Smith was there until the last few years. And um, it's just so a what is it? What is it about Palm Springs that attracts so many people that have been around the world and they want to live there? What is it? Well, I think it just has to do with your mindset. There's a metaphysical energy in Palm Springs, I think. That comes from those mountains and the the uh, influence of the Indians there for so long. It's it's palpable. You can feel it when you drive around the corner. You leave you know the ten, the, the I ten, and you get on one eleven. You just go. Oh. I just let a big sigh of relief, and I feel that people choose to be there for a reason. Uh, you could go anywhere, but you choose to live in Palm Springs. That's a mindset, you know. And uh, people are more relaxed. They're kinder in many respects. You have a lot of tourists. You have a lot of elderly people. You have a ton of gay community. And the mix is fascinating. It's a wonderful mix of people that appreciate each other's value in the world, you know. And there's a lot of uh, phenomenal philanthropy. We do so much fundraising in Palm Springs for the most amazing causes. Uh, the, some of the richest people in the world have homes there. Steve, are you walking so, around? Is terrible interference. Terrible. Uh, terrible. Uh, yeah, it's, there's just a lot of noise in the hallway here. Hold on, I'm, I'm going to pop outside. Right. Hold on. Okay. I'm yeah. going to do better. I thought maybe, you, you, were, I thought so, maybe you were so Lucy, killing a dog. Well, he, yeah, I didn't know what was happening. So, Lucy, what is it like being in the entertainment business today, cabaret and theater? Is it different than years ago? Have you know? Have you know the digital world changed anything? Uh, you yeah, know, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I've been doing the cabaret. We'll call it concerts, cabaret, what you will. The difference is only the size of the room. Um, for 30 years now, I guess. Can you believe mm -hmm. that? 30 years, mostly with Ron Abel, believe it or not, all that right. time. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, we've seen we've seen a big change in what people are willing to uh, pay for. For one thing, you're more on your own, which I I think is true in the, the show business in general. Like 
one of the things that's changed, here's, here's a huge thing, and you will understand this more than anybody the last time we spoke. It used to be that you would get a job, you would get paid pretty well for it, and you would show up and they would have public relations people and they would, you would do interviews like you and I are doing today, and they would promote your show and then, you know, you would get paid and you would leave. And now you sort of have to talk to the promoters yourself. You might have, I have an agent that books for me. I have several, actually. I'm not exclusive. And, but a lot of the things that come up, they say, you can work this room and they'll pay you this, which is fine. But they don't do any marketing or promotion at all. You have to do that all on your social media. Mm. And I just think that is such a crock. Like, really? So I have to come there, do the show and everything, and I have to also promote the show on my social media. And I said, look, I'm not one of those people with 75,000 followers. I'm not an influencer who weighs 11 pounds and tries on small bikinis. You know, that's not who I am <laughs> because that's who they all are. Influencer are influencers are, in, for the most part, you know, right, um, right. rap artists or, or very young people in skimpy clothes taking sexual poses of themselves in strange, you know, at Stonehenge, you know, it's, it's bizarre. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a crazy and they, time. And it's a crazy time, and I don't know what it's about, and I'm not that person. I'm never going to be that person. So I have to say to a lot of the gigs that tell me that, well, I'm very sorry. I do have a lovely official Facebook page, and I have Instagram, and, you know, but I'm not that guy. I can't do that for you. So I called up Lois once and said, you got to help me. I'm going into Birdland. And they don't, they've only got one person asking me anything. And they said, nobody does, you know, press for, for this kind of gig anymore. And I called Lois and she said, hang on. And I got nine interviews later, I was talking to people all over the country who had radio shows and, and you know, magazine ads. But you have to know somebody. You have to pick up the phone and do it yourself. Well, why do so, you think that That's changed? why she's amazing. <laughs> well, yeah. well, that's for Lucy, sure. Lucy, why did that change? What did they tell you? They don't have the money? You know, I guess the audience so. I don't know. There? They don't tell you. They don't tell you. They just say this is the way it is. I have no idea. I think they don't want to spend the money. Maybe it's, yeah, I guess. I mean, you know, I understand the business end of all business. I'm a business person. I get it. There's an X amount of seats in the house. You can sell tickets for this much. It costs this much to pay the band. It costs this much to pay, you know, the right. union, whatever. I get that. But didn't, wasn't that always the case? So I don't know. I just know that I'm not making any more money now than I was 25 years ago. Making right. a, way, a lot less. And it's not because I'm not paying, you know, playing arenas. I never played arenas. So it's interesting, but I do it because I love it, and um, this is what I do. I can't think of, I can't do anything else. I, this is what I love to do. So, so, so what do you think is going to happen to the cabaret world? It's always. I think they'll always, there. they'll always be cabaret. They'll be always be. That's just like they'll always be acting, even though acting sucks too. I mean, it's it's a two way street. Like you can't get an agent until you're in something and and you get a big splash these days, and you know you can't get a big splash until you get an agent. So. It's with chicken or the egg. It's always crazy. And poor actors are constantly asking me, you know, what do you do? What do you do, young students? And say, well, how do I how do I get in the show business? How do I get an agent? And I go, <laughs> do I know? And even when you get one, that doesn't mean they're going to work for you. I mean, I've been through every single agency here in Hollywood. And the most of the jobs that I've gotten, I guarantee you, have been through my office, through my own phone line myself. Ah. People call me directly, you know? It's weird. Agents really don't get jobs. They negotiate contracts. I have always found that they're in They're not my supposed to, yeah. That's right. Yeah, they don't, they're not, and they're I not have getting a, you a job. You have to get the job. It's that simple. You get the job, basically. You go in there, you get the job. Sometimes they negotiate a contract, and they only want to be with people who are going to make the money. I get it. You know, yeah. um, I have a manager who's fantastic, and he's he was my agent a million years ago, David Williams, and then he decided he'd had it with the agency business. It was just getting too corrupt and too bizarre, and he didn't like it. And he said, you know, I'm just going to take a, a vacation. And when he came back, I said, well, wherever you end up going, that's where I'm going, whatever agency you go in. And he said, I'm not going to one. I'm going to be, I think I'll just be a manager and just manage the people I care about. And I went, wait a minute. I, like, I need you. So I haven't had an agent since then. And I just call him my management because he Manager. basically helps me decide my life. And, but then you have to get, he's not authorized. Uh, managers cannot negotiate contracts. So I get a Mark Sendroff. I get another wonderful lawyer to negotiate a contract, you know? And so if you, you're, you're at the helm of your own little company. 
you know, when you do this now. It didn't used to be that way. You were kind of a work for hire person and you showed up into a wonderful organization somewhere and you gave them your talent. You showed up and you, you knew your lines and you did eight shows a week or you knew your part for the, the series or the movie and everything else revolved around that. You got their PR people and, and that's still true if you do a movie or a television series. They always have public relations, stuff like that. Lucy, agency. how much of your time percentage wise is doing the work versus looking for the work? Have you ever broken it down in your mind how, how you wake up every morning? Is it, I'm looking for work today or I'm looking for the next no. gig? Or no, I, I like you, you know what? It never made me comfortable to think like that. I don't know why, it's, my ego's too big. <laughs> so <laughs> I never think of I'm looking for work because I always have too much to do. I never have any free time. My, my paper calendar, which I still keep, thank you very much, always looks like Walt Disney threw up on it after the end of the month, you know? It's <laughs> too, too crazy much. And um, I don't know how it, it gets like that. It just does. So I don't think about looking for work, although I'm always saying to the people who book me, it's not like I don't need to work, folks, please. You know, like, let's let's move on this. Um, so I have good people that I rely on who go out there and they go to the conferences and they, we just I just finished editing a new quote unquote sizzle reel for the new I Got the Job songs from my musical past show that we did uh, started last summer and we're doing this year as well. Uh, and I had a, a wonderful video taken of it last summer. But I was so freaking busy with life and I had the two grandchildren coming at the same time that the whole year went by before I did anything with it. And so I fin just finished with my friend Steve editing it, you know, making a little tiny seven minute thing you can watch. And so that's that, you know, I have to do stuff like that. And we're constantly making new flyers and new descriptions of shows. I'm putting new shows together all the time. Uh, Ron and I are doing a whole brand new show uh, with a different theme about life and about, it's really about a show with songs that only a woman of a certain age could sing because once you get to a certain age, there are just certain songs you don't want to waste your time with those lyrics anymore. You know, it's like, I don't believe that. And I don't feel like if love doesn't come, I'm going to die. No. I'm <laughs> right, not. right. You know, I, I get it. It's not going to happen. So I'm not singing that anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I yeah. get that some of those songs are beautiful, but the older I get, the less I feel like I should be singing them. And um, and then and then very excited right now. I'm putting together a show with Clint Holmes. He and I oh, want to do really? a show together. Yeah. yeah. So we're getting together this week and uh, in another couple of weeks, and we're putting material together that we can do together, a duet show, and that's exciting. So my job is to keep coming up with good shows and then put them out there to the agents and say, these are the shows I have. And then they take them to the powers that be. But of course, because I'm not exclusive, if I see a place I want to play, I'm not beneath calling Jimmy Caruso or the people at Feinstein's or whatever and saying, I've got a good new show. Do you want it? And I learned a lot from my friend Ann Hampton Calloway, who is a, her, the best promoter of herself, I think, in our business. And she and I are buds. And I thought, I always thought, you really do this well. You're on it. She said, yeah, 24-7, you know, it's a lot. She doesn't have five children and two grandchildren. So. <laughs> right, right, right. That's right. a big difference. A big difference. Mm -hmm. Lucy, what roles are you most proud of, and what do you want to be remembered for? Other than mother and grandma, you mean? Yeah, yes. like roles, roles. Yes. 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 Wow, that's a good question because there's a lot of them, and on different uh, media, you know. I mean, I love the jazz singer. I I really do. It was my the first big film that felt like a big mega mega buster film kind of thing to me mm -hmm. i loved working with neil diamond and they treated us like royalty we went to the Cannes film festival it's a great character which basically my husband wrote um right. and i'm very proud of that mm -hmm. he they were going through a lot of different scripts and he nobody was in charge really at that time and and so they sent me my script they'd already replaced the leading lady and i was coming into it cold and we thought the script was terrible, so Larry sat down and rewrote all my scenes. And I showed up, wow. and I just handed them, like, one page at a time, and I said, there's a couple of changes on here. Is, that, is it okay if I... And the new director, Richard uh, Fleischer, said, oh, this is great. Who wrote this? And I said, oh, we just, I just kind of tweaked it a little. He goes, yeah, 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 we're going to do this. It's fine. Here. <laughs> yeah, that's so, great. So he didn't get screen credit, but he wrote that. And I think of things like Pippin because of the trapeze thing that I took on uh. and accomplished. That's an amazing thing to have done at 65, four years old at the time, you know? And my one and only, because it was about seven, eight months on the road 
tap dancing my butt off, which I'm not, you know, a tap dancer from birth. I had to really, really study hard to become good enough to dance with Tommy Toon. And we, we did the national company of my one and only, and I'm so proud of what we did in that show. And, um, you know, there's some series that I did that I thought were great and fun. The Son, Sons and Daughters show that I did for a season never right, really right. got anywhere. But I yeah. thought it was well written and very smartly directed. Um, Seesaw that you mentioned is probably one of the best shows ever. Uh, really a great script and wonderful music. It's a little dated now, so it doesn't get revived very often because it's all about a woman saying that, you know, is he good for me? Right. Am I good for him? He's good for right. me, but am I am I good for him? And I don't think women think like that anymore. And uh, and of course they're playing our song because when do you get to have your Broadway debut and work with Neil Simon and Marvin Hamlish, you know, and, Mar and Carol Bayer Sager on Broadway? It was just it was in incredible. Robert Klein, and yeah. um, so it's hard. They're like children, you know. You how do you pick your your favorite? How do you pick right. your favorite? Right. Right. I have to go back to the Pippin one. Were you freaked yeah. out on that trapeze swinging over an audience of a thousand people? I mean, is that just absolutely? Uh, I, well, I, first of all, I didn't have at the to, same time. Did, did you see it, Steve? I have, yes. But you didn't see I, me do what I did. You saw uh, no, Pippin. I, I saw I saw someone else doing your part, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah, have yeah. See, I see well, the part. Well, it's yeah. never just to clarify for people who didn't see that show. It's not a swinging trapeze, right? It's, it's, it's a, a kind no, no, that goes up high. It's called right. dance trapeze, dance trapeze. So it goes up high off the stage, but no wires, no nets or anything. And you you do a, an, a, an act with another acrobat who holds you, and you walk around him, and he slips slips upside down, and you hang upside down, and it's quite astounding and was I freaked I wasn't and let me tell you why I thought why? I might be because well first of all if I was I wouldn't have done it you can't yeah. be freaked and do that and um, sing no singing was easy that was that at was the same time everybody at the said, same time to be freaked out and singing at the same oh, time oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah no, like how do you do the that thing, you, I just I thought if they can teach me and they said they could and they start slow I mean, the whole thing, we had to learn the whole entire show and all the choreography and the music and everything in three weeks. Not, I didn't get any extra time because it was oh. acrobat. As a matter of fact, I only had 10, 10 minutes a day with them. And oh I could never God. take it home. And I couldn't take it home and, and re rehearse, right? So I felt like I'm never going to learn this. I'm never going to be ready. But Gypsy Snyder, who ran all the acrobats, and uh, she just said, she said, just follow the program, Lucy. Just trust the system, and you will be ready. We have trained lots of ladies who thought they couldn't do this. <laughs> wow. Oh and my so God. that's what I did. And, you know, it was a great metaphor for, for life. Just put one foot in front of the other. Do as you're, you know, just don't look too far ahead. Just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing right this minute. And if today you're supposed to be strengthening your core, then that's what you do today. And tomorrow you're going to learn how to do this. And, da -da. and once you get into the routine, it was always about now you sit. Now your left hand goes on the rope. Now your right hand goes on the other rope. Now you stand, you put your leg here. It, uh. Each thing had a point that I had to accomplish. And if I did it right, we did a good job. And if I started thinking, yeah, this is I, you know, then I would have screwed it up terribly. <clears throat> I had to look graceful and sexy. You know, that was my job. And Are you actually, I, have to, I have to say that what you just said it's such a life lesson for anybody mm -hmm. Everybody. that mm -hmm. wants to be in entertainment. You just overwhelm me by, you know, ju just that whole, it could be a metaphor right. for life right. or for a career or I, anything. I agree. And a I lot of people don't more. have that. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you a natural athlete, though? I, I, I was just curious. No, I'm not. Oh. And I tell you, this is the honest to God truth. I don't know why. I think it was because we were getting ready to move from Connecticut to Palm Springs. I wasn't going into the city and you know with my trainer every day i wasn't going to the gym all i was doing was packing boxes and moving stuff and arranging for furniture i mean i was sitting at a desk or packing every single day for months and yeah when they gave me this offer to do this show i i said i am probably in the worst physical shape i've been in a long time i mean i was just my core was terrible i was soft everywhere and I said, I have no muscles. And they brought me in, let me try the trapeze, did a few things on the floor with me to see how flexible I was. Uh -huh. And they said, we can, we can teach you. It's fine. We, you, we have three weeks. You'll be fine. I thought, three okay. Weeks. Oh, my and God. And I tell you, I tell you, when it was over, when the show was over, I, it was six months on the road with that show. Yeah. I was the best physical shape I've ever been in in my life. I was, I was 63 years old. And 
I had a body like when I was 27. It was unbelievable. I want to be, I want to be in the circus now. <laughs> you want to be in the circus? <laughs> That's great. I want to go join the acrobats. I want to go be in Las Vegas and Cirque du Soleil. That's oh because my. you always think you're going to go home, and somehow you're going to keep that up. You're going to do, oh, yo, sure you are. You're going to do your exercises every day. And you're going, now it doesn't. It all goes away. But I was very proud of doing that. That's wonderful. Lucy, before we get off, I do want to ask you about, you know, I see you on Facebook every day, you know, with your political activism, you know. What makes you so involved today? Uh, and, you know, you express and you get try to get people together and you try to teach people what's going well, on in the world. And you have a tremendous following of people. And, well, you, and nobody is really, uh, you know, uh, screaming at each other as they are on so many other platforms from so many other uh, people that I see. Uh, how yeah. did you get involved in it? And why are you a constant cheerleader? Well, God, I'm just a person who lives on a planet that's melting, and I'm looking at a maniac who's t trying to parent our world. You know, I how can you not? I have children. I have grandchildren. I I, I care about what's going to happen to everything that's going on, and I don't. I never thought of myself as political. I really have never been a political rally person. I don't even want to do that, you know? I really don't. I want to sing and dance and entertain people. I don't want to have to think about this. That's the problem, though. See, I think a lot of us get so comfy in our lovely, pretty world we live in here. And for a lot of years, our main concern was what happened to Michael Jackson or whether Chris, you know, you know, Caitlyn Jenner, Bruce Jenner, every day, every, you know, really? And we've stopped, and we stopped listening. We stopped paying attention to the corruption and the crazy that was going on. And we, 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 you know, it's like with Pippin, I let go of the rope and uh, started to hang. And that's what people in this country, probably all over the world, really, we have to start paying attention again now. We kept thinking, wouldn't it be great? We hire these people, we vote them in, and they're going to take care of us. That's what we hired them to do. They're going to do a good job. That's what, they're good people. No, people are greedy. People are corrupt. People want for themselves, and it's our job to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we have to stay alert, you know. We, we can't, like, we're parents. We, we can't just let our kids wander the streets. We have to be alert to what's going yeah. on. We have to vote. We have to read. We have to listen. And we can't believe everything we read on Facebook. You know, if it's, if it's Lucy Arnaz's site and you're sure it's Lucy Arnaz's site, fine. But if it's some other website that looks official but it's not it's now we know it's from russia it's a robot it's we don't know so read a paper now and then you know go look up stuff at there still are libraries around you know it's people have to just be not be so damn lazy uh, and and i care i'm very frightened and i work best out of fear i guess you know that moves me fear moves me to do something and i'm frightened for the planet i truly am and we all have to step up the responsibility. Elections have consequences, and we've got to get involved. You can't not be involved in today's world anymore because it's just That's so right. dangerous. It's so dangerous. That's right. That's right. And I try to do it without being as bad as the people that I'm criticizing. You know, I don't want to be a name right. caller and vicious. That's what I try not to do. I try to use the unity training that I have, you know, through unity was a, a wonderful influence in my life to make me think differently. It's, a, it's new thought is what it is. And when I, when I think that way, I try to approach problems from that perspective, like we're all the same. I have to see the divine spark in everyone. But that doesn't mean that I have to agree with the crazy ass choices they make, you know? Absolutely. And, uh, and I won't carry on a vicious conversation with somebody on my site. If that happens, I will just ask them to please go find somebody else to abuse, you know? But I just want to educate and then let people do what they'll do. That's all. If I see something that makes sense to me, I share it. That's basically all I do. And it's, that's, that's very little, it, really, Lois, but I feel it's, you know, and if someone starts. And if someone starts name calling, you don't call any. Don't call, don't call a name back at them. Instead, send them to Lois, and Lois will call the name. So <laughs> she'll that step up true. and take care of that them. Is so, true. Yeah. That is well, true. there are people for that, and they're and they're better at it than I am because you know I don't like to get in those name calling fits because everybody else wins. I don't That's like what Lois that. Does well, you have been doing a beautiful job. I really have to thank say. you. I you appreciate are, that. Yeah, and we and we hope. 
that you continue. And Steve, I, I think will. that's a wrap. I think it is. So once again, Lucy Arnez Luckenbell, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And uh, I'm Steve Greenberg with Lois Whitman. And we have been lying on the beach. Take care, everybody.